Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, I am your host Josh, aka Jamal, and today I'm beyond excited to be doing this interview with the voice of Rampart and Apex Legends, Sumatra and Overwatch, and she's done a ton of other things ranging from live action to cartoons to songs to theater. Can I get a rounding round of applause for the amazing, the talented, the humble Anjali Bimani? And I know I said that name wrong, so... Dude, you said it perfectly! Okay. That was my biggest fear coming on here. You Not nailed it. Oh, hang on a second. <laughs> Let me fix this lighting. I completely forgot that because we're on Instagram, um, one needs to have a slightly different camera set up. So um, we don't need these. I don't know why these are even in my ears right now. Um, I'm a technical genius. That's why. Uh, let me turn down this light so it doesn't look like I've covered my face in olive oil. Um, I mean, you know, these are the these are the major problems that all of us run into now that we live an entirely digital life. Um, think of us. How are you? I am nervous, but amazing. Oh, honey. <laughs> well, okay. First of all, don't be nervous. Be excited. They're the exact same emotion. I talk about this. Oh, on I am series. excited. I'm both. I talk about this. I talk about this on I Am Fun Size on my series. I Am Fun Size. It's like the third episode I did is that nervousness and excitement are the exact same feeling. You're just expecting a different outcome. So excitement means it's going to go well. So boom, here we are. <laughs> I'm so excited you're doing this. Well, before I get into this, I would just like to say thank you so much for coming on and taking your time with me. I'm really a huge fan now researching what you do and what you're about. I am a fan of yours. Like I'm a huge fan just researching what you do and just watching interviews you've done and watching the stuff and content you put out there is just absolutely fantastic. And I'm really glad to be doing this. So thank you so well, much for coming on. You're and welcome, but I have to throw that right back at you because, and this is, I'm not, can we curse on this? Go ahead. I'm okay, good. okay. I'm not bullshitting you here. Um, I, uh, when you sent the request to my manager and she forwarded it to me, it took me 10 seconds of watching one of your interviews to be like, oh yeah, I want to talk to this guy. I don't give a damn how many followers he does or doesn't have. I like this dude. I like this dude. I like your energy. I like what you're putting out in the world. So it's just more proof. And I hope that everybody who is watching and everybody who is on social media understands this. Numbers don't mean anything. What matters is the effect you are having on people. What matters is the connection that you are making with people and you make great connections with people. So I love what you're doing. Love, love, Thank love. That really meant so much to me because I, I really do this. And sometimes I, um, I'm just like, wow, like, should I just, why am I doing this? I feel, sometimes I feel like I should just stop doing this. You know what I mean? No, then, no, like, no. Like that. The only reason to stop doing it is if you don't like doing it. That would be the only reason to stop, honestly. It's like saying, I'm gonna stop having nice conversations with people at the supermarket. Like, why would you stop? Why would you stop if you enjoy it? Why would you stop? Because you're making other people's days. You might as well do this at the beginning. If you guys ever want to send uh, a message, a private message or a DM or whatever, the best way to do that is not DM me on Instagram because I, I miss a lot of those messages. It's always best to send me an email. You can hit me up at Anjali at IamFunSize.com. That is a special dedicated email for the community, for people who have questions for my show. Um, for people who have questions about conventions, any of that stuff, I or one of my team members, but usually me because I'm a control freak and I want to talk to everybody, uh, will always respond to you. So there you go. Ta da! All right, guys, so now let's get into it. Some cool things I found out about you while I was researching things to talk to you about was that you stopped playing piano at the age of 14. Talk about that. My goodness, where did you get that deep dive? I was watching, uh, <laughs> I was watching I Am Fun Size with Fred Patterson. I love that man. Uh, that's, that's, all, that's my bucket list. Like I have to oh bring God. him on one day. And that I should be your that. bucket list because he is one of the sweetest human beings in the world. He is just so, so wonderful. And I was watching that and I was like, oh my God, that's important. I'm going to write this down. I'm going to write this down. Got my pencil wrote immediately. So I wrote it down just to make sure I don't forget. So, yeah, so I did. You know, uh, it's such a, it's really a, a damn shame. Um, and speaking of multitasking and overwhelm, I'm, so when I was 14, I, like so many kids in high school and junior high, was just 
like involved in so many things because you sort of feel the pressure to be. I had so many clubs and so much academics going on and after school plays and I was on the swim team and I was doing all of these things and something had to give. And unfortunately at that time, the thing that seemed the most expendable was playing piano. And what's sad about that is probably, it was probably the thing next to acting that I enjoyed the most. But I, at that time, because I was so achievement oriented, um, felt like, well, this is, this is more for fun. This is more personal. This can go. I can't, I can't give up key club because that's important for college. I can't give up this. I can't give up that. And my, my very sweet and talented piano teacher was not one of those piano teachers who was very, very strict. He, he seemed to really understand that pushing me harder would just make me break. But uh, at, uh, I think the unfortunate side effect of that was I didn't take it as seriously that I needed to practice and I needed to do all these things. And since I didn't have the time to practice, because I was waking up at 4.30 in the morning every morning to be able to get stuff done, going to bed at 10 o'clock at night, like that was my high school experience, it's a long story. So that was, the, that was kind of the first thing to give. Um, now the good news is, I do have a piano now, and I do occasionally sit down to it, even though I'm nowhere near as good as I was when I was 14. But now I only do it for my own pleasure. I don't even play with my husband at home. Like I don't want it to be for anyone but myself, enjoying the feel of the keys, the expression of it, because no matter what you do for a living, even if you are an artist for a living, I think it's important to keep some of it and some of your creation and some of your experience for yourself because there has to be something in your life that you're not doing for other people. There has to be something that is yours to own. And I'm sure at some point or another, I will use it professionally because it fits into my world. But right now, I really, really, really enjoy sitting down and just feeling that for myself. But like I said, I'm, I mean, like, like uh, my skill level is low at the moment. <laughs> Definitely, I can tell that I haven't played in like 900 years. Definitely. <laughs> I can I remember like one song, and that's about it. I can clearly relate. Uh, my guitar right here that I got for my birthday, uh, well, around my birthday. So it ha it's been on and off, really, because I've done interviews so much, and I edit stuff, and I have to put something because I do all this by myself. I edit. I promote, I, I do that all by myself and I have to dedicate a lot of time into that. And while I love guitar and I really, I've been learning to play uh, what I've done by Lincoln Park. I'm a huge Lincoln Park fan. I love them oh, so wow. much. And I, w I wanted to learn that I'm, I'm through the intro, but I can't get to like the main course. Cause like I said, I'm so busy, got school, this editing and I, it's just like, <laughs> it's a whole lot. But once summer hits and I graduate, this will be played nonstop. You know, funny thing is I wanted drums originally. And I told my mom, and she yelled at me and said, no, <laughs> hey, I'm getting Like, hell, I'm not listening to drums all day, uh-huh. No, it was like, crazy. It's about, you can get drums. <laughs> right. And you know what's crazy is I have a neighbor who, like, when I walk up and down to get the mailbox, you can hear him play drums. Like, they're so loud. Well, you hear dude, the this is why your mom knows better. <laughs> so, that's to blame your neighbor. <laughs> right. And... And I, I love instruments. I love music so much. And that's something I'm trying to get into as well as I have like uh, if, like books over here, like songwriting books, just talking about how they break down songs and just, mm -hmm. I have a lot of books. I'm very much into like self care and stuff like that, even though I need to work more on that. But I'm into that, I have books like that. That is a lifelong thing. That is a lifelong thing. Trust me. We are all gonna be learning about how to take get better care of ourselves throughout our entire lives. So that is a lifelong thing. We're all, we can always be better at it. It's better to remember that you can always be worse at it. Absolutely. So I have a ton of books for just like how to take care of your brain and how to write songs, guitar books, of course. So when I get the time, I can like get into it. But yeah, I just have all this stuff. What, um, get into it. what books are you, what, what book are you reading or books are you reading right now about how to take care of your brain? I'm intrigued because I love that kind of stuff. In fact, I just picked up a new book that I'm obsessed with right now for the same thing. Hold on, let me get this right here so I won't be off the screen for too long. It's called Brain Sense, a guide and workbook to keep is inverted, but to keep your mind and memory sharp. I have not seen, who's that by? Let me, let me see Dan. It's by Linda. Uh, Sasser, Linda Sasser? Is yes. Right? Okay. Yeah. Got it. Amazing. I, um, so I had the joy of being on a, on a clubhouse panel 
or in a clubhouse room, whatever you call it, uh, with this incredible brain coach, like number one brain coach to, to stars and all sorts of people. His name's Jim Quick. And I was, I was like, I don't even want to talk on this panel. I just want to sit here. And I took like 19 pages of notes while listening to him. And his book came out a year ago, a year ago yesterday. It's called Limitless. And it is all about training your, learning how to learn, training yourself how to learn. And without going into too much detail, part of what his personal story is about is that he suffered a traumatic brain injury as a child. And so he kind of had to learn how to retrain his brain and retrain himself how to learn. And so many of us are, um, are burdened with these limiting beliefs about how much we can do or how well we can learn or how well we can do things. And I mean, the, 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 some of the tools that he presents in this book are so simple that you're like, there's no way that can work. And then you try it and you realize, oh my God, it, like I feel smarter and I just talked to him for like 10 minutes. Like it's, there's, there's, it's, it's mind blowing. So I started devouring this book and, and uh, I highly recommend that anyone, uh, everyone go to Jim Quick, K-W-I-K on Instagram, follow him, sign up for his free classes, all of the stuff, because it's, I'm telling you, it's changing my life. And no, I don't make any money and no, I'm not a partner. Um, I want everybody to, I just want people to benefit from this because it's changing my life so much. Usually what we do is um, we like overcomplicate, we tend to overcomplicate things. I know myself, I tend to do that. And we think that usually like the solution or the answer to our issue is usually gonna be like that overcomplicated, like, oh my God, it's gonna take years. But then most of the time it's, it's, it's usually just so simple and just like you just need to put your time and energy into it it's not mm -hmm. that difficult so i and it's not just your time and energy it's your time and energy to the right thing and that is often the challenge is because similarly to working out like i have this issue for you know probably the majority of my life um where i devoted so much time to working out and fitness and what I thought was right, that I burned myself out on it because I wasn't seeing the results I wanted, but I was spending all this time and energy doing it. And so I just like stopped working out for 15 years and it was bad, it was bad. Like my body stayed together, thankfully she presents well, but it, but it, I, the, I wasn't feeling good, you know? And then I started working, at, I went to this particular gym um, and this particular trainer, it's an ultimate performance in Los Angeles and my trainer, Eddie Baruta, and the program that they put me on was so simple, not easy, definitely have to put in the work, but so, such a simple thing compared to how complicated I had made it, that I was almost angry when, it, when things started to change. And my mood, this was the most important thing, because I was actually really, really depressed at the time when I started with them. And I, I was very seriously considering going to see a psychiatrist and asking if I needed antidepressants. And my trainer was like, totally support you in that if you choose it, but give me a little while with you training before you do that. If you feel safe and if you feel comfortable, give me a little time. It took me three days of just being physically active in the right ways that all of a sudden it was like something clicked in my brain. And I thought, okay, give me a break. Hang on a second. I've been complaining about losing my dancer butt for 15 years and it takes, you know, a month to get it back. Come on. That's, if I had known this before, I would have saved so much energy and so much emotional, you know, so much stress and all of those things. So yes, the time, the energy, but finding the right resources. And that can be, that can be a very tricky thing, especially in today's day and age where the internet has so much information, like too much information. So yeah, exactly. the reason why I'm like this right here, this is good information. Um, it is very good information. And the Ultimate Performance Gym blog is free. So everybody go there too. I'm just gonna recommend things your whole Instagram live. I'm gonna be like, sign up for this, follow this person, read this book. Right. <laughs> oh no, no, completely. I'm, I'm all fine with that. And another thing that I find out about you that was I was really excited about is you were on Marvel's Runaways and I really freaking love that show. And what was it like being a part of a Marvel project? 
so much, such a joy. I mean, it's I, look, Marvel doesn't do anything poorly, right? They don't do. They're. They, I mean, like, look at just these two series that have just come out: WandaVision and Falcon and the Winter Soldier. Um, we're not going to say anything that's going to spoil either one for anyone. Everybody watch them. If you haven't seen, uh, if you haven't seen Captain America: The Winter Soldier and Captain America: Civil War, see those before you watch the Falcon and the Winter Soldier because you'll need them for backstory. That's important. Um, but uh, such extraordinary shows for completely different reasons with completely different styles, right? So Marvel doesn't do anything poorly. So it was a joy. It was such. It was fantastic to meet new friends, and I actually, um, you know, I got to work with Brittany Ishibashi, who is just the sweetest and kindest. And also, um, I didn't get to work with. Uh, Annie Wershing, which I had known her from before, from the music theater world and mutual friends. And then Ever Carradine, who was also on that show, she and I went on to shoot a movie together in 2019, so she's a friend of mine now too. So it was just a, it was just a super, super fun thing. And it was a fun little plot line on the show. Um, and I got to dress up in like a hazmat suit, so I felt like I was in an OK Go video. So it was really fun. Super, super fun. Super fun. I really... I'm bummed out that, um, cause I know they were gonna do more with uh, another season with Runaways. I know they were setting up stuff with like Ultron and stuff. Cause there was a character that named up at the end that's like very much tied into like Ultron. Mm -hmm. And it said that Hulu, because of what Marvel was doing, I mean, Marvel just bought back Fox. So there's a lot going on now. They have like the rights to like X-Men and stuff. And of course they're doing their own Marvel TV shows like Falcon and the Winter Soldier and Loki. And I'm so excited for Loki, I can't even take it. And oh this Marvel God. too, like that's gonna be cool. It's all, it's all gonna be off the charts. It's all gonna be, it's, I'm just, I'm really, really excited. I mean, yes, I understand you being bummed, but uh, I also know that the Kevin, the grandmaster of all things Marvel is a very smart man. And I suspect that if there is a way to create a future for the runaways, he's probably working on it. Like that man, I, I swear to God, he's thinking 300 steps ahead of everybody else, so. So one way or another, I think there'll be a future. For, I, I don't know. I, I, I predict in my magic b crystal ball, I, I, I would think that he's got his eyes on other things. So my first question to you is, what is one word you would use to describe your childhood? Wow. Only get one word. I know watching me think is so gripping. It's gripping television. Um, <laughs> Loved. I would say loved. I was very well loved for my entire childhood. You know, any any feelings of insecurity or inferiority or anything that might have I might have developed in my own head um, were not in any way, shape, or form a product of the family that I grew up in. They were maybe a product of how I interpreted things outside of me, and that was a lesson you have to learn on your own. You know, um, but. Uh, I even remember um, being in therapy in later years and getting angry whenever a therapist would try to be like, well, tell me about your child. What was your parenting like? And I would be like, screw you. My parents are fucking awesome. If I'm screwed up, it's not their fault because they're amazing. So back off my parents. Don't touch them. Um, yeah, I was so well loved and they set such good examples for how to love. Um, my brother is one of the most exceptional human beings on the planet and always made me feel special and smart. I mean, he's a genius. Like he is hands down, like a, a, an absolute genius and he's talented in all of these things. And yet he's the kind of guy that will never allow you to feel less intelligent than anyone else in the room. He will always make sure to elevate everyone in the room. You know, um, and everyone feels respected and listened to. And, and so like, I, yeah, I would say my childhood, I just felt very beloved all my childhood. I probably took that for granted in a lot of ways because I assumed that everybody grew up in a family like that. Like I never understood why people would come and complain about their siblings. I'm like, I don't know what your problem is. My brother's awesome. Um, so yeah, beloved. That's awesome to hear that you've had such a good hot childhood because when I talk to a lot of the my voice actors, just actors and people in general so far, it's they talk about how their childhood was like 
good, but there is like messy parts, you know, like their parents didn't, weren't supportive of them or, mm -hmm. or they got bullied a lot or like their childhood was just so crazy and that it was really mm -hmm. bad. And it's just really good to hear for a change that like your child was amazing and you were right off to the start. And it's really a blessing to have that. Well, I will also say this. Of course there were messy parts. I was bullied. I would do all sorts of, the, you know, like like crappy things happened. I had an eating disorder when I was in high school. There were, sure, there were things that went wrong, but I still see them as formative, not things that blocked me. You know, the, the I say this a lot. I even didn't, I didn't, I'm fun size episode about this, that I like to give the pain a purpose. If there was, if I went through something painful in my life, I need to give it a purpose. Not, okay, well, God made this happen for a reason. Cause again, I'm too much of a control freak to believe that there's someone in the sky deciding for me, but I am going to decide why this thing needed to happen. It, especially, and, and if there's no other reason to go through pain, it's to give you compassion for someone else who might be going through the same thing and give you the ability to be a flashlight for someone else who might be in that dark cave at the same time. You know, I tend to be as open as physically possible about my own personal struggles, not because I want to be like, I don't want to emotionally vomit around people, over people, but I want people to know that you can have any plot points in your life and still have an amazing life. You know, you can have really difficult circumstances happen to you and still create the life of your dreams. It's just like actors, we're always told as actors, you have to work with a set of given circumstances, right? You know what the plot points are, but it's how your character deals with those plot points that makes that character come to life. And that's what we do in our lives. It's how we deal with the adversity. It's how we deal with success. You know, some people get successful and turn into assholes. Some people have the most difficult lives you can possibly imagine and are the kindest, most compassionate people on the planet. So it really is, what do you do with the, the circumstances of your life? So my story, not my fake story, but my genuine story that I believe to be true is that my childhood was full of love despite all the challenges. Um, because I know that was there. And that for me is the predominant thing that I look back on because that's what got you through all the challenges. Yeah, I completely agree with that. Like give the pain its purpose. You know, like there's been a lot of situations where I've gone through like, I talked about this with Steve Bloom um, a few days ago. I talked about how I was bullied out of tap dancing. I was bullied out of <laughs> doing musicals and stuff like that. Cause I remember, um, man, I was so dedicated to it. I remember <laughs> one time I was like, I had like a headache in my head and I felt dizzy. But I was like, no, I'm not missing this performance. And I went tap dancing my heart out, dizzy and feeling a little sick, but I was great. And and then I remember one day this person came up to me and was like, why do you dance? That's very feminine of you. You should stop doing it, you're bad. And I felt so bad that I was just like, we're not doing this anymore. So I stopped mm. doing musicals. I stopped tap dancing. I just quit all of that and I left it behind. And I just created a lot of like insecurities in me that I'm still dealing with to this day. But like, I'm slowly getting back into all of that, like acting and telling my friends and I are shooting short films. I'm making my own short film. Um, I'm, get, I'm getting into music again. So I'm going back into those things that I really shouldn't have left behind because that like imagine if I would have stick with that like where I'd be now like what type of plays I would have been in but now like that I'm graduating now like I said I'm, I graduated a few weeks like all of that I missed like being in high school plays middle school plays mm -hmm. acting I, I was in band for a little bit but that's that's because I had a, a short story about that me and I had a great group of friends like we joke around all the time and we roast each other go back and forth but they all move to like all over the country so I just love band because I was like oh well I'm uh, whatever. Okay. but it, it, I just really feel like you should stay with what you love and and just do what you love and don't let anyone take anything away from you. That's the most yeah. important part. Yeah. It's, it's hard though. Say. It is very hard. Like it's, again, it's one of those things. It's simple, but not easy. Um, because especially when you're younger and you know, people, anyone can say, a teacher can say something well-meaning and completely change the course of your life just by saying something insensitive if they are well-meaning. 
if your parents by mistake say something that you internalize, it's hard. And and it breaks my heart to think that someone, you know, when you were younger said that to you and it stopped you. But what is amazing is that now with a few years more of maturity and a few years more experience, you are looking back right now and being like, yeah, but that thing gave me joy. That's where the sauce is. That's where the sauce is. If it gives you joy, if it lights you up, that is where the sauce is. And also, the older we get, less people can tell us what to do. So, um, <laughs> oh, the only person, like the only, honestly, the only person that can stop you from doing something is yourself. Well, I mean, and if it's if it's legal, let's put it that way, uh, you know, legal and ethical. But the the really the the worst person to say you can't is yourself. Um, cause that's the most powerful. I can't, that's the most power. It's like, it's such a, it's such a debilitating thing, such a debilitating thing. But I will also say again, and I, as I keep pimping out this book, um, one of his uh, big limitations was that for the longest time he thought he had a broken brain because a teacher said that, you know, um, to let him off the hook cause he had had a brain injury. Hey, listen, that's the kid with the broken brain. Be nice to him. But he internalized it and thought, I can't read, I'm broken, I can't do anything, I'm useless. And it was him shifting that narrative that enabled him now to help millions of people because he learned how to learn. He learned how to do these things. And for you, I think it's the same thing. You can inspire people. I'm glad that I'm getting back into it and that I am slowly getting back into those things that I love. And it's just really good going back to revisit it. So it's really awesome. Yeah. And now that we spoke about bullying, how would you say your childhood adversities helped strengthen you? Well, um, part of it is compassion. Absolutely. Compassion, 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 because I think compassion is one of the most important things. It is also one of the most important weapons we have against injustice and hatred and racism and everything is compassion. So um, even though people tend to think of it as a soft word and a gentle word, I think it is incredibly powerful. So definitely compassion. Um, I think that anything you have to fight for, you learn a little bit more from than things that come easy to you. So for me, probably the biggest thing I had to fight for was I had to fight to like myself. I had to really work hard on that because for whatever reasons, whether it was my overdeveloped sense of what I should be, um, you know, I could probably go into a whole therapy something, I don't know, I could probably sit there and psychoanalyze myself to try to figure it out. But it took me a really long time to learn what it meant to love myself and to like myself. And the fun thing is it was very recently that I understood for me what loving myself meant and what it looked like. And the way I figured it out, it was like this giant light bulb burst into my brain, was I realized loving my, to love myself, I just had to literally do what I do for my dog. So my dog is arguably, I mean, like my husband would say, definitely the creature I love the most in the world. Um, like I just love, love, love my dog. It's my baby, right? And. I realized when, on a particularly low day when I was like, what do you mean love your, I don't know how to love myself. I don't like myself right now. What's this bullshit about how to love yourself? And then someone tells you, you can't love other people until you love yourself. And then you're like, right, thanks. I'm totally fine. So uh, when I realized that, okay, this is for me, what it means to, I love my dog, which means no matter what, there could be a bone sticking out of my leg, I could be bleeding out my neck, but that dog will be cuddled, that dog will be fed, that dog will be walked, that dog will feel valued. That dog will be fed healthy foods, that dog's body will be taken care of, his heart will be, like, I am gonna take care of that dog. Even on a day, even if he pooped in the middle of the house or did something bad, I'm gonna take care of him. Even if I'm annoyed at him, I'm gonna love him. You do not have to like yourself at all moments to love yourself, but you do need to continue loving yourself because love is really, love is paying attention. And if we are not paying attention to the messages that are coming from our heart and from our soul and from our own, you know, ethical, uh, uh, 
you know, a, a barometer or whatever you want to call it. If we're not paying attention, we're going to miss out and the world is going to miss out on some kind of unique contribution that we have to give the world because we're too busy making our small. So I think, I think all of the struggles, any of the struggles that I had as a kid all the way through last week, I think they, they have all led to me being able to actually get excited when I face some kind of adversity because I know from doing it enough times, I'm going to survive it. You know, I'm not going to die because I, I, I failed at an audition. I'm not going to, I'm not going to die because I didn't do a good job on stage. Heartbreak isn't going to destroy me, you know, because you, once you've survived it enough times, you're like, okay, let's see what the next challenge is. And if I can climb that ladder and I can go a step higher, that means I can reach down and pull someone up with me. Right? So that becomes exciting. That beca then you build that trust in yourself that you can handle anything. That becomes exciting. Wow. I think we're really supposed to see. Wow. Oh, my God. Whew, that's a lot to take. Oh, my God. <laughs> but I think that you don't have to like yourself to love yourself. Like, you don't you ha like have to be pleased with yourself all the time to like really love and care for yourself. Like, that dog analogy was like perfect. Like, what the what is going on? This is too no, I see, when, I, when, I, when I when that hit me, like it sort of felt not dumb, but I was like, I've got to share this with the world because it was my simplest way into that concept. Because I just get annoyed when people make blanket statements like, "You can't be in a relationship until you love yourself." I'm like, screw that. I was I met my husband and started dating him well before I knew how to love myself. Well before I really had a sense of it. I was doing loving things, but I didn't really understand what it felt like, you know? Um, it means the difference between, like another great uh, uh, difference that I, that I learned is, you don't beat the crap out of yourself for doing something you don't like or for not being good at something. You just assess yourself and do better. If I fail at something, it's not a reason to be like, you're such a loser. I can't believe what's wrong with you. You're so dumb. You would never treat someone else like that. You, would, you wouldn't do it. You wouldn't treat your sister like that. You wouldn't treat your friend like that. You wouldn't treat your dog like that. But we'll do it to ourselves in a heartbeat. That's not loving. That's not useful. And it doesn't make you better at the thing you failed at. So there's no reason to do it. There's no reason. Assess and then progress. That's it. Oh my gosh, because like everything you're speaking on, like struggle with personally from, from, from like, I, I still struggle with this. Like when I mess up with something or like something to go my way, I automatically look at myself and I'm like, mm -hmm. what's wrong with me? Profile. Like, what's, me, yes. like, what's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? No, it's funny because, and I hope she doesn't mind me outing her like this, but my mom used to do that. You know, and she would do it so lightheartedly. She would say things like, oh, Anju, your mom is so stupid. Let me tell you what she did. And I'm like, quit calling my mom stupid. She's a freaking surgeon. She's a genius. Why would you say that about yourself? But we do that to ourselves, right? And then we start repeating those stories to ourselves. And it doesn't get us any further. It doesn't make things better. I'm just so really intrigued by the... Um, the, 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 you know, like the kind of knee-jerk reaction that we, we do like that, because I don't really know why we do, and I, or at least I haven't figured out a reason that I believe to be true um, for why we do it, other than I do think sometimes it gives us a false sense of nobility that we, I know I suck, so it's okay that I suck. And you're like, okay, first of all, you don't suck, so you don't know you suck. And second of all, that just gives us an excuse to not do better the next time. So not useful, not useful at all, but we do it. I look, I'm, this is another thing that I, I've learned in the last few years because everything that I'm talking about, like I said, it's simple, but not easy. I still struggle with beating myself up. I still do all of that, but I've found little tricks to remind myself to stop doing it. And one of my favorite ways to do that is to remind myself, Hey, listen, you know what you're really good at already and you don't need to practice anymore beating yourself up. You know how to do that. So stop practicing that. You're good at it. You can always go back to it. Let's practice 
not beating yourself up because you're not as good at it. And the things you're not as good at are the things you need to practice. So focus on that. You don't make me cry. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Cause it's like, it's just like, you're just saying stuff like that really resonates with me. Cause like, as a kid who goes in high school and who doesn't feel as popular or who just doesn't feel like, that's a whole other thing that I'll tell I'll say for, I'll tell you for another day. That's but like, there's just like a lot that I've gone through personally. Like mm-hmm. my dad passing away in 2019 was like, I was like, it was insane. Like, and I'm still dealing with that. And I know it's been like two years and I should move on from that. But it's, it's, it's still like, it's still like weird. I don't know, it's weird. But I can't explain it, but like that, like during that time, it was just like a lot of anger, a lot of like self-hatred and just like a lot of beating on myself. Cause I feel like I could have done more. And my, my mom, my friends always say that I do this, that that I, whenever something happens to another person, I beat myself up. And I do, because I feel like I could have done more. And yeah. I gotta stop doing that. You know what? I, 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 I have done that before too. And I think at least for me, um, I can't say that this applies to you, but you know, I lost my dad in at the beginning of 2017 as well. And, um, and I'm so sorry for your loss, because that is very recent, 2019. And I know how much that that has got to still be affecting you. But I think sometimes we we take responsibility for things we had no power over because it makes us feel like we might have had some power. And one of the most painful things as a human being is to be powerless in the face of injustice or to be powerless or to feel powerless in the face of tragedy. It's one of the hardest things to do when you are a person with a big heart. And so I think sometimes in order for us to cope, we we turn that sadness on ourselves because it's way better than having to be like, this horrible thing happened or this very sad thing happened and there's nothing that we can do about it. It's happened already, you know? But we, I think it's part of the grief and it's part of the coping mechanism. And as time goes on, I know, I know, and as your family continues to remind you to, it, you couldn't have done anything and all of that, I. I hope that as you peel away those layers of grief, you'll be able to realize that it was not on you. Life happens and death happens and it is like horrible things happen in the world and many of them are not under our control. The only thing that is under our control is what we do with them as they happen. And you remembering your father and all of the beautiful things that he gave to you and all the love that he gave to you and carrying that forward is the most important thing you can do for yourself and for him absolutely the most important thing my condolences with you as well thank you so much like wow it's 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 a lot of emotional uh, baggage i remember when um snoop dogg was talking about this on the breakfast club when uh dmx passed away love him too mm-hmm. that's the piece of dmx he was talking about um how god lets us play lets people ah oh, god i'm about to mess it up so if you want to guys that's okay up, that's okay give us your version it was a breakfast club, and he was talking about some people are here for a, a period of time to make our lives better, and and he was like, DMX made my life so much better. He made me smile. He made me happy, and I'm not going to remember him crying and being sad. I'm going to remember him by celebrating his life and being yep. happy, because that's what he did to me. He didn't make me sad. He didn't make me unhappy. He made my life rich and full, and when I heard that, I was like, that is perfect that is literally spot on like that is the best way to remember anyone how they made you feel and yeah well it's that maya angelou quote too right i believe it was maya angelou who said people are not going to remember what you said people are going to remember how you made them feel that's what people will remember the most about you is how you made them feel and that's what we can carry forward in the world and that is how we help people have a legacy after they're physically no longer here is to carry that forward and look i i mean i i don't know your mother i know like you you had a mother and a father so at least 50 percent of you from your from your father like you are your, I told you, your energy in 10 seconds, I watched that interview, one of the interviews that you had, and I was like, I, I gotta hang out with this guy, right? Look at that smile, I gotta, I gotta hang out with this guy. This is a joy-filled human. This is a joy-filled human. That came from somewhere, that started somewhere. That is a legacy your father passed on through you. So don't worry about what you didn't do or couldn't do. 
focus on what you can, which is continuing to be this awesome person that you are and putting that out in the world. This is why you don't stop doing the interviews no matter how many people are watching. Because you put that out, look, there's 17 people online right now. I mean, 17 people are soaking in your joy. 17 people! How often are you in the room with 17 people? Rarely, <laughs> right? I'm, I'm, well, certainly right now with the pandemic, I don't remember the last time I was in a room with 17 people, other than when I was shooting something, you know? So this is important. This is your legacy. This is your legacy, boo. Absolutely. Now let's switch over to something more lighthearted. <laughs> I noticed that you came from a theater background and more of doing on screen and stuff like that. So that begs the question of, how did you get into voice acting to be able to voice such roles like we're going to get into later, like Rampart from Apex Legends and some are from, from Overwatch? Um, so this is fun to, to talk about because it's so random. Um, I consider voice acting, I consider all the different media that I've worked in another branch of the acting tree, right? And so voiceover, I mean, I wish it was a sexier story, but it was just like my agents started sending me out on voiceover auditions and then I started booking them. Um, not right away, again, like it wasn't, you know, like there were, there were no's in there too, but um, it just kind of flowed naturally from a desire to continue storytelling. Um, and I will say that I do honestly believe that my theater background more than anything, uh, my theater and singing uh, contributed to my success uh, in voice acting, just technically. Because if you can do eight shows a week uh, on Broadway, then your voice obviously has some endurance to it and has some variation to it, has some unique characteristics to it. And you understand about characterization and you understand about creating different characters quickly and live and thinking on your feet. So um, yeah, every, every new thing I've done has usually come out of, oh, cool. They want me to audition for this. I don't know if I can do it, but I'm gonna audition. Let's find out. And uh, it's worked out well for me. I like to say yes. I like to tell stories. I like to find fun and new ways of telling stories. You know, and anytime someone comes up with a new way and and there's a new project coming out with some new, um, you know, some new creative way to tell stories, whether it's like interactive TV now or. Or, um, or RPGE, like things like Critical Role and Undeadwood and Real Life Frontier that I've gotten to do where I'm like, you mean I get to play a role playing game and we're doing a show? Come on. Like that's my dream world. Um, anytime that there's some new way to tell a story, I, I, I get very intrigued. So, uh, so yeah, that's kind of how the voice acting thing started. Uh, one question I want to answer real quick that someone says, is it ever too late to start voice acting? And from what nope. I gathered, yeah, I was gonna say, from what I gather from stuff I've watched, it's never too late to do this. I mean, it's as long as you've got a voice, it's not too late to start voice acting. And and you could come. I will and... say, I will say one of the most important things to do that you can do, regardless of whether you are a voice actor or not, is to begin learning how to take care of your voice, just like you take care of your body. Your body, because your voice is a physical instrument, is learning how to take care of your voice well. You know, not smoking. Um, hydrating well, learning how to uh, uh, not put too much strain on your vocal cords when you go out to loud places, like basic vocal hygiene, which you can look up on the internet and there are a ton of great uh, uh, places to look that up. Um, that is a that is one thing that can, if you have done damage to your voice, that would probably be the only thing that I could imagine would make it too late is if you'd like done unwitting damage to your voice. Um, but for the most part, m most of us have not. And uh, so, yeah, no, no, there ain't no time. I don't feel like there's, I feel like there's really a too late time to start acting, period. You know, I think, I think it's just a fun thing to try. And I also get annoyed at people who are like, well, you can't just start acting. You can't just start voice acting. You can't just jump in. I'm like, why the hell not? Really, why the hell not? I think Chris Pine was like a business major and look at his career. Like, the, what, why, why, why would you say you can't just? Of course you can. I can't just be an athlete. I can't just be a, a, a ballet dancer. Yes, those things are physically, there are physical requirements. But when it comes to creative stuff, I think you can jump in anytime. 
most definitely i was gonna add on to what you were saying that i think it was morgan freeman who didn't really break in to the inter entertainment industry until like his early 40s like he was yep. working into it like he got like there's so many examples you can find of people who didn't get break into this industry like until their 30s 40s 50s like it it took time and it takes time yeah. to really get to where people are to be the next hugo weaving or be the next rdj like these people are still in this industry still going but it takes a lot of time and if you're willing to put in the time then hey go for it but if you're not then you know also I think that we do a disservice to artists everywhere. I was actually just having this conversation on another podcast. We do a disservice to artists everywhere by thinking that you've only quote unquote made it if you're famous or if you're a part of something famous. That's the one. We don't do that with other careers. We don't tell doctors you have to be a famous doctor to be successful. We don't tell engineers that. We say, are you making a living doing the thing you love and doing the thing you intended to do? Are you are you out there doing it every day? Are you maybe not even making a living? Are you out there doing it every day? Or are you out there doing it with regularity? Then then great. Like your definition of success has to has to be independent, especially as an artist, has to be independent of your level of fame. Because if you're in it for fame, that's a whole other that is a whole other thing. Another beast. That's a whole other career you know, is, is managing fame and managing celebrity is a whole other set of things that you have to deal with. I, fa being quote unquote famous, which I still don't think I am, but like people knowing me or knowing my name or knowing what I've done uh, is incredibly gratifying and, and humbling, but it is not the thing for me that defines my success. I have my own definitions of what that means. And it is completely independent of how well known I may or may not be. And it's important, very, very important to do that for yourself in any aspect of life because you are the only person who are with who is with you 24 hours a day. If you are depending on what other people think of you, you're gonna be on social media all day. You're gonna be like Googling yourself all the time. And then you then there's no room to live, right? So um, I think it's really important that that people understand that you again you can start anytime but what are you doing are you talking about is it too late to get famous i i would argue that there is no guarantee that if you start young you'll get famous so if that's the reason you're doing it then you're doing it for the wrong reasons absolutely couldn't agree more fame fame isn't what it's all cut out to be anyways mm -hmm. either if i'm being honest i mean as long as you're happy with what you're doing the fame should really be secondary i always worry about numbers because i feel like i have to because it's like i i you know people or agencies are always going to be like well since you don't have like ten thousand followers or a million followers you're not doing it blah 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 and it's like they've always like doing this interviewing thing even though i love doing it i've, I've had a lot of bad or like icky experiences with trying to get people sure. on because and I, I completely get why agents are very protective over their clients i mean you have to be there's a lot of shady characters out there but i personally feel and i know it's gonna be a ton of people out there who do this and want to get people on is that i feel like i have enough of a resume like i just got steve boom on who's one if not least the one a world famous voice actor and i feel like that should be enough to be able to at least get like 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 i don't know troy baker on i feel like i should be able to get him on like, so like here's this. what i'm here's what i'm gonna offer you as a way to reframe this. Um, there are a lot of draws on a lot of people's time and what they may value in one moment or what their representatives may value in one moment, which isn't always what the person might value. What, what may be valued in one moment is not necessarily going to be the thing that another person values or devalues. It's not necessarily something that they, they might not have time for. So it's not, again, it's not about you. It's about where is that person's priority in the moment? You know, because I know Troy and I know Steve and they're both incredible people. But I also won't assume that either one of them is or values or devalues anything based on their decisions because I know that they have a life that I know nothing about that they are handling in that moment, right? And I think that that is the case for, for any of the guests that you might involve, uh, 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 that you might invite on your show. Had you come to my manager at a different time when I was too busy to be able to talk with you, I might have had to say no. Even though I watched you for 10 seconds and loved you. You know, I might have had to say no.
but that's not about you. So that limiting belief that agents and other people might be helping you to continue in your head about that it's about numbers or whatever, that's business, that's business for them, that's value for them, all of those things, great. But that should not be how you value yourself. I think that I think that there are certainly um, probably all sorts of ways that you can look up on the internet that increase one's audience. Oh, bug! Did you get a bug? Oh yeah, I had to kill a spider. I'm sorry. I don't like spiders, so I had to kill him. I totally spider. understand. Get him. Get him. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm sure there are you know things that I don't know about social media and podcasting and all of this stuff that you can look up uh, to to increase your following. So yes, there are things again you can assess and progress. That's fine, but don't take it personally. Because it ain't about whether you're good or bad. If it was, that means that all most talented actors would be working all the time and the ones that aren't talented wouldn't be working all the time. And there are some really bad actors who work all the time. So it doesn't, like, it doesn't, it's not a meritocracy. You know, don't, don't take it personally. And God knows if anyone asks me, I'll be like, you gotta get on this guy, you'll just have fun. You gotta go hang out with Josh. You'll, you'll just have a great time. If you got the time, hang out with Josh. Right, and, and I and thank you so much because I tried to remember that, and I've gotten way better with that before because I remember but one hard. time. Where Again, it, easier said than done. Simple but not easy. All of those things. I have that problem. I get, I, I still get a little bit annoyed that that you know some of my wacky, silly, me being a dork with my best friends videos do better than my I am fun size videos. When I'm like, but my I am fun size videos help people. I put that out there to help people. Why aren't more people seeing it? I'm like, it doesn't matter why aren't more people seeing it. Someone is seeing it. It is helping someone. That's all that matters at the end of the day. And yeah. one character that you could say has helped people is Ramport from Apex Legends. Oh, Ramba, Ramba, Ramba. Uh, this one's I've got Johnny on, Erica Lutchbro, and then you. So I've added three new Apex people, of course. Uh, you've done Chris Edgerly before too, right? And Roger Craig Smith. And Roger Craig Smith. Roger and I went to high school together. Are you serious? Mm-hmm. Do, wait, do, okay, hold on. Now we gotta talk about this. Wait, so like- We didn't we spend the... a lot of time together because he was, I think, two years younger than I am. So we had the same drama teacher, but weren't in the same drama class. That is so cool. Oh my gosh, that's really dope. I don't know why I freak out over that. That's so cool. And it's oh. fun. That's why I freak out, because it's super fun. And I think, uh, oh God, now I'm, no, I'm, one of the other gals went to Northwestern. I think it was either Allegra or, or Justine went to Allegra. I went to Northwestern and I went to Northwestern. So it's oh, a little tiny little world. That's so cool. I love when uh, old, old friends come back together and meet again. Yeah. I feel like I'm gonna have that experience when I graduate high school and do go on my own life path. I'm probably gonna meet uh, some people I haven't talked to in like years. It's gonna be so cool. So when you guys, when you and Roger found out that you were on the same game, like how did you guys react to that? How did we what? React to finding that out. Oh my God, it was amazing. I thought it was super amazing. And Roger had been like in it from the beginning. So he was super casual about it. And I was like super nervous and like, oh my God, don't tell anybody. Don't mention it to anybody and make sure that it's quiet. And I'm so scared and meow, 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 meow. And Roger was like, don't worry. You're gonna come in. It's gonna be awesome. This is the family and everything. And Roger, Roger and I had been in touch a few years earlier because I was uh, I was raising funds for a play that we were doing an out of town tryout of, and he very graciously donated to our to our cause, and so we'd already been in touch a little bit. Um, and he's just a, what a what a what a uh, what a lovely, lovely, lovely human. Arguably one of the best improvisers I know too. He's just improvisationally freaking hilarious, absolutely freaking hilarious. So yeah, that was awesome. Roger was really nice. And I remember, I will never forget when we first started, I was like mumbling, I was freaking out, I was super nervous like I always am. And before these, and he was like, dude, relax, you're fine. My goodness, take a breath, you're fine. I was like, okay. And then, how you doing, Roger? <laughs> He's such a cool guy. I he really he as much as I can. And, and he's just so, so, so down to earth and just really cool. And that was a really fun interview I got to do. I did not know he was as short as he was, but we're not gonna talk about that. Because like, I thought he was like six foot, because, you know, when you think like that. Because his personality is that big. Yes, that's what I'm saying. Like, hit, like his personality is just like, 
freaking crazy. But you know, shout out to Roger Craig Smith if he ever sees this. But um, the yes. character of Rampor is really cool to me. I did research on her before I started because I'm very the narrative for Apex is so freaking cool to me. How they add like the story from the Outlands and just all this stuff to help build the character. Your character was introduced, of of course, in season six of the game, and and there's been so much added to that character through the seasons. So, what is one thing that they've added to her story, or something that they added in general that you love the most? Oh my God, I love that she and Valkyrie are friends. I love it. I love it. Um, I'm eager to see how that gets developed as time goes on because Erica Ishii and I are, have been friends for a while since well before this. And so the fact that, um, that we are completely chaotic and ridiculous in real life and now we have to, to like my character, look, Rampart is super chaotic, obviously. Like I love that she has no filter. Um, Cause Symmetra is all filter. So it's a completely different thing with Rampart. I just love that she has zero filter. She'll say anything. Um, so I really, really, I love that she and, and Val are friends. I think that's probably my favorite thing um, about her. And I'm really excited to see how that develops. And of course, season nine uh, just released or is releasing? It's coming, it's coming out. I think, I think the gameplay trailer just came out. I don't... I don't remember exactly when season nine starts. I think it's May something. I should know this. Um, but I know they just released the gameplay trailer with the arena stuff and all this super cool stuff. And here, look, I can't play Apex. I can't get past the training module. I've tried, I'm a failure at it. Um, so there's just a level of complexity that I cannot keep up with. Um, Andy is too slow. There's just so much cool stuff in that game. So much cool stuff. I find it slightly intimidating. That's why I'm like, I'll stick with the story and y'all play it. I'll be like the side seat driver. I'll just be over here like rooting for people in the back and like telling them what to do, even though I can't tell what's going on because it was moving so fast. Um, but uh, yeah, no, I'm, I'm excited. I'm excited about all the cool stuff that they got coming out. That's really, um, I'm so excited for season nine and they're teasing a ton of Titanfall stuff and I'm a Titanfall fan. I'm, I'm yeah. a game since uh, the pandemic really got me into Titanfall. So one positive is these interviews and, the, and uh, Titanfall. <laughs> Real quick, I want to slide back here and find this comment um, because it was important to me and I just didn't want to miss it. Someone else was, uh, was, talking about how their anxiety was really high and ah reese mercer um i am sorry that you have been experiencing so much anxiety lately and i know there are a lot of people with who already have existing anxiety issues who let's face it the last 14 months of our lives have uh have not helped us with those things um but i would just say continue to take good care of yourself continue to do whatever you need to do to make yourself feel safe um, and I hope that you know and always remember that even if you are quarantining, even if you are solo, you are not alone. And there you can always reach out to people. We have this beautiful internet. There's a, you can always reach out uh, and, and say hi to people and, re and ask for support. It's, we're all always here. There's this beautiful community here. For you. So I just wanted to make sure to go through and, and hit those things. But it's no secret that Apex Legends takes place, and speaking of Titanfall, takes place in the Titanfall universe. And I want to ask you personally, do you think there is room for Ramport to be in a potential Titanfall 3? I think there's room for Rampart to be anywhere because Rampart barges her way into everything. There is a reason she's my size with the biggest freaking gun on the map. That girl does not, that girl straight up Kool-Aids her way into, if you remember that reference, uh, straight up Kool-Aids her way into anything. So sure, there's room for her in any universe. She's gonna make room for herself. How did you create the voice for her? Well, that came, that was a, that was all mutual decisions between myself and the developers and the voice director, Eric Kraber. Um, you know, uh, uh, Mohammed, uh, one of the developers and Manny and Ashley and uh, the writers, um, we all were there when I was recording and this was, we started recording before the pandemic. So we actually had some time in the actual studio. And uh, so it was something that we came to together. You know, Manny had written all of these Cockney slang lines for her because she theoretically kind of had a, a, a British Indian 
uh, uh, vibe to her. Although obviously this is like on a planet far, far away in the far off future. So there's an element of fantasy to that concept. But um, but also we wanted her to represent an Indian Indian. So maybe an Indian Indian who had had that background as well. Um, and I love it so much because I, look, I know a lot of, I know a lot of Indian folks in the UK that sound exactly like that. I know a lot of Indian folks in the UK that have purely British accents or purely Cockney sounding accents or purely, you know, sound like they're from Newcastle or whatever. So this was really kind of a unique amalgam of the things that they wanted to be her circumstances. Um, and then just her, like, her sass is just me. Um, like there are things about, there are certain things in her voice that like, like a lot of the time she laughs, like she has this kind of like snarky laugh, which is totally my snarky laugh because part of it is I was laughing at the line because I thought the lines were funny. And I love that, that, that they kept that in because it sounds like she's laughing at herself because she thinks she's so witty, which is perfect because she totally obviously thinks she's hot shit and she is. So I really, um, so I super dig that, that came, that came out of that. And I think, I don't know for sure, but I think uh, that her line dope came out of me saying dope so much. So I'd like to think that. They might have planned to put it in there already, but um, but I, I I say it all the time. Originally, I had hoped, you know, Blizzard would put it in as Symmetra. It's not very Symmetra. So we got it in as Rampart. That's so cool. Um, yeah. Apex Legends has really taken off. Not only is it has blown up since it's launched, it has comic books now, action figures. Gosh, what's like? I mean, who oh, the knows? Pathfinder's right? Quest, Pathfinder's Quest, that book, book, the lore book. Oh, so cool! So much stuff. There's so much, and who knows? Maybe guys can get like an anime or a cartoon or something like. Dude, from your mouth to God's ears, that'd be awesome. The possibilities for this franchise is endless, and I just want to ask you, as someone who's been a part of this since season six, seeing legends like Fuse and most recently Valkyrie be added, what's it like to see the success of this game? It's it's incredible, and it's and it's wonderful to see it after having been a part of Overwatch's success, and then to see a completely different juggernaut of a story be embraced and taken and run with. It's just. It's just a huge testament to the power of the gaming and online community to me because gaming, the gaming community, you know, and I hate using the word fans because I, I, I really think of us all as more, more this than like you and me separate. Um, but the gaming community, it's unlike any other in terms of its level of support for each other, the, um, the, the, the creative juice that so many people have. I mean, you just post a picture of yourself doing something and there's fan art as your character, you know? Like there's just so much creativity that explodes out of this community. It, it blows my mind on a regular basis. And it's very inspiring. Cause it reminds me, I don't, you're okay, Anjali, you can't just sit on your butt and not create things because these people are doing it. They're doing it for free. They're out there doing it and nobody's paying them to do it. So get up, Anjali, make some, make cool stuff. Get it together, get, offer something. That's how I Am Fun Size happened, was that I was so in love with the generosity of the, the online community that I just thought, I, got, I have to give something back. And the thing, the most valuable thing that I knew that I had to give back was my experience. And it's the most unique thing that I had to give back. So yeah, it's been incredible watching, uh, seeing how, how Apex is, is beloved. Also, it's incredible being a part of this team because the writers, the developers, the, the, the actors, everybody is so close. You know, we all have this Twitter DM thread and a Twitter text, I mean, and a text thread and we're all hitting each other up regularly. And it's just a lovely thing. It's just a really, really lovely thing. And not to be taken for granted because you know, uh, just because it happened with Overwatch and then it happened with Apex does not mean it is not incredibly unique. Each one of these moments is unique. It, that, this is why I don't believe in also people being like, oh, that was your big break or this was your big break. Because if we only have one in our lives, how sad would that be? Every extraordinary experience is a big break. It's a chance to experience something awesome. So um, I am loving this ride with Apex because it is unique and it is beautiful and the stories that they are telling and the way they are telling it is incredible. The camaraderie is so powerful. The connection between Respawn and EA and the talent is lovely. I mean, it's just, it's all, it's all pretty awesome. 
what makes Apex Legends, besides, of course, the freaking fantastic and amazing community that you guys have, it's so awesome. I got into the game, uh, I remember playing it at launch, and I kind of fell off of it and doing other things, but then I spoke to Chris, and I was just like, you know, let me get into Apex, let's see what it's about. I got back on, it was fun. Um, they still haven't added solo mode, so get on that. Um, but it's been so cool to just see like all the new things they've added and what they're gonna do with season nine. But what makes Apex so unique from other, other battle royales? Obviously there's Fortnite, PUBG, Warzone, Blackout. It, there's just so many battle royales out there. What gives Apex its flavor? I think it's the, it's two things, it's the lore. The lore is pretty exceptional, and I think it is the uniqueness of all of their characters. Um, they don't they don't do representation like a tag word, and they don't do inclusivity like a tag word. It's actually it's built into the fabric of the game, um, in a in a in a unique way, and uh, and I think both of those things are really really special. Um, because it enables more people to feel included. It enables more people to feel a part of the game, you know? And, and who doesn't want to be, who doesn't want to be a member of a club? Who doesn't want to be a part of the, the group, especially when the group is this group that opens their arms and says, come, come join us. Not screw you, this is an exclusive group, but it's come join us, come play, let's do this fun thing. So um, again, it's the, the community. And, uh, and I think the stories that they are telling are pretty extraordinary pretty damn extraordinary i was gonna say if you didn't say it i was gonna just talk about like the level of diversity for the games like yeah. the, the 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 representation is freaking fantastic and amazing yeah. they have lgbtq characters and your character was indian and there are diverse characters and you know all all of that stuff and 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 again I'm, i've been very lucky to be a part of two triple a games they're both very keen on that kind of uh inclusivity and representation and in very different ways very, very different ways because it is more of a testament to the very simple truth that none of us are one thing. We are a sum of all the things that make us who we are. We're some of our experiences, our abilities, our size, our gender, our race, our sexual preferences, our neurodiversity. We're, we're, we're an amalgam of so many different things. And, um, and each one of these characters is that as well. Where do you hope they take Rampart's story next? I am gonna plead the fifth. No. I am going to. I am gonna keep my mouth shut on that one, and I will tell you why. I love fan fiction and fan theories, and I get very excited to read them all. And I would never want to uh, limit other people's imagination by putting my imposition on it. So. I have a feeling that you guys can come up with way more cool things than my little brain can. So uh, I'm gonna keep quiet on that one. I mean, obviously I think she should be at the forefront of everything because she's the most awesome ever. But uh, but yeah, I'd be, I, I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't really know. I mean, I, li I, I like the whole like um, uh, uh, friendly friction that she's got with Mirage. I love that backstory. I love the Valkyrie stuff. Um, that we've seen so far, and I'm eager to see what else comes out. Um, yeah, I, 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 I uh, yeah, I'm gonna leave it at that. All right. Next, I uh, would love to talk a little bit about Overwatch, and that's been a, such a another smash success with great, a great, fantastic cast, including, of course, yourself, but Fred Tattershore, Chris oh my God, Freeman. Ash. Matthew Mercer, I'm probably missing a ton of others, but Darren everyone's Darren Hall in both games. Yes, Dar yes, oh, I can't forget him. Amazing voice actor too, like, there's just such a wonderful cast there. And how would you describe your, how would you describe meeting all of these like legendary like voice actors, like Matthew Mercer, for example? Well, it was fantastic. And like many experiences I have had in the past, meeting people who are, who are have great notoriety in the field is I didn't know at the time that people were as quote unquote famous or had the notoriety that they had. So I met them one on one as human beings first and as peers first, which is the best way to meet people. 
you know, because you're not thinking about what do you do for a living or how famous are you or all the stupid things that don't really matter. You're just like, who are you? Let me find out who you are. And what was so great about that is that I met most of them um, at this uh, Blizzard event after the first BlizzCon when, um, when Overwatch came out in 2016. And everyone was just freaking lovely and amazing and and family oriented and warm and accepting and just humble. I remember talking to Matt and Marisha uh, about Critical Role at the time and how how awesome it was that these guys are doing this cool thing and they're getting married and all this like all sorts of cool things. So yeah, it was it was really, 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 really lovely. It was lovely and it was lovely that we were all coming to it at the same time at that moment. Not like we did have new heroes coming in every season, but at that the moment when we all first met, there were a big chunk of us that met at once. And then Carolina and I sort of made it our mission to run around and meet all the rest of the folks that we couldn't meet. And um, and of course she became one of my best friends in the whole wide world now she's stuck with me forever. But uh, yeah, it was just, it was, it was a, it was a game changer. It was a life changer to get to meet this beautiful community of actors who were so, and I, and I, you know, it, 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 again, it's just more testament to my personal belief that the most genuinely talented people in the world are not assholes. They are not full of hubris. They are not cocky beyond what they deserve. They are not, the, the, the most talented people are also some of the most generous and kind and open with their, with their hearts, even if they are protective or shy or introverted, they are lovely, lovely human beings. I hate the saying that don't meet your heroes. I hate it, hate, hate, hate it. Um, because I don't believe it to be true. I'm like, meet your heroes. Because I'll be honest, I can't think of any time where I've met one of my heroes and they sucked. Yeah, that's that's one of the things I was nervous about doing these interviews was I, always had a saying, never meet your heroes in the back of my head. I was like, oh God. It's a gonna be stupid awful. saying and I hate it. <laughs> I, 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 I will was say so it now. I hate it, I hate it, I hate it. I was so scared to meet Roger Craig Smith and Steve Bloom and all these voice actors because I thought- And hearts. So nice. I will never forget some of the, uh, Roger Craig Smith has complimented me. And I remember what Steve Bloom said to me on and off the interview of what he said to me, just being so nice and so dear, or what you're saying to me right now, like, I'm gonna take this to the grave with me, I'm gonna use that when I need inspiration, I'm gonna watch these back and just be like, come on, back to this, I'm like, like get, get back into the mood, because that's just, it means so much to me that I, something I'm doing is at least getting someone noticing or making someone happy. I've had so many yeah, people yeah. just been like, doing, Joshua, you're doing amazing, just seeing your growth, and getting these people to talk to you and hearing their stories and hearing some of your story because you put yourself into it. Yeah. It's just amazing. And I'm just like, I this is crazy. What the heck? What well, how did this these interviews start with me just like with a set goal in my head of just like I was originally the thing with these interviews, I was only gonna interview three people and never do this again. Like I was mm -hmm. done. I was gonna <laughs> stop doing it. And then people just kept sending someone down, so was the next interview? And I'm like, I um, I don't because I don't you come at it with joy, and they would yeah, and they and they just were like, Josh, we keep doing this. You found what your purpose is, and I'm like, I have, I love this, and I'm going on sixty plus interviews. Like, I think tomorrow is my sixty. Wow. Either tomorrow or in a few weeks will be my sixtieth. So I'm, wow. I'm I'm definitely reaching hundred by the end of this year. That's amazing. For sure. amazing. So, it's just yeah, no, you, like I said, you come at it with joy. So don't don't stop until you feel like stopping, until it's no fun for you anymore. Yeah. Because when it's no fun, there ain't no need to do it. Absolutely. <laughs> Preachers of the choir, facts. <laughs> and no reason. Yeah. For, I've heard rumors of her Overwatch 2, and I know there's like a lot of NDAs and stuff we can't talk about, of course. Have you heard about uh, Overwatch 2? And what do you hope they do with Overwatch 2? I have heard of Overwatch 2. I can tell you I've heard about it. A lot of, and we've all heard about it. Um, all I know is probably all you guys know out there. And if I knew more, I wouldn't be able to tell you. Um, but I did get to play it at BlizzCon in 2019. Get to play the little beta when they announced it. And it was so good. And I will say that I was very happy that it was a, a story-oriented thing because I'm much better 
at uh, at like team play against a common foe than I am against team on team play. Uh, so that was cool. Um, I only know how to play Symmetra, so I'm a bit limited. Um, but uh, yeah, I, 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 I actually can't tell you much about it. So um, I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to learning more. Awesome. Well, now we're gonna transition into my favorite part of the interview. It's called Weird okay. and Wacky. You have okay. one minute to answer a series of weird and random questions. No one has gotten to regular 15 questions, although my good friend Simon Norfleet is the championship holder, answering a total of 14 questions. Do you think you can beat Simon? No, but I'm gonna try. Okay, well, okay, well, let's try this. Ben Pendergrass, who plays Fuse, used to be the tower holder with a regular 12 questions answered. So if you be either Ben or Simon. Look, I'm gonna, prepare, I'm gonna prepare myself for answering like two, and then I will be proud of myself, whatever I do. Let's do that. All right, I'm gonna start the timer in three, two, one. Weirdest food you've ever eaten? Uh, uh, it's called bitter melon. Um, it's a, it's an Indian uh, uh, squash, and it tastes like crap, but it's really, really good for you. Who do you wish you had never eaten? Uh, probably the bitter melon. Weird, uh, worst type of topping on pizza. Oh, anchovies. A song that's overrated. Oh no, uh, Happy Birthday. It's the worst song ever. The Happy Birthday song needs to be revived. Not Stevie Wonder's, but like the actual Happy Birthday to you. It's terrible. It's a dirge. Birth, uh, oh, first thing, movie that you loved growing up? Um, Monty Python and the Holy Grail. What did you think you would be doing when you got older? Being an, uh, architect or a rock star. Weirdest thing you did as a kid? Uh, I talked to my Barbies. Dumbest thing you did as a kid? Uh, I hung off the balcony to see if I could pull myself up and the wife discovered that I couldn't. Superpower you wish you had? I would, uh, teleportation. Movie you wish you were in? Anything by Marvel. Uh, and time. I'm gonna ask you one more question to make it 11 because you glitched out for a little bit. So I guess the, the uh, last rapid fire question is, um, what was your first ever memory? I know that's a weird question. Getting snow in Cleveland, Ohio. All right, so you've answered a total of 11 questions you were one right, short right, from that Ben. Respectable. That is respectable. I also gave longer answers than I probably should have if we were timing the thing. So. I didn't it's need to explain good. what bitter melon was. Now I'm going to ask my final question. And before I ask it, I would just like to say this has been an absolute joy and such an emotional just thing for me that I've loved. And I have so much love and respect for your work and for you as a person. Like, I've just, like, through this, I've just been, like, I feel like we're friends. Like, I feel that, like, I just, I just because feel like, God. And, and I love to hear that. I love it. I, I want to do interviews because I just want, I want to, I, I also want to learn about stories, but I also just want to make awesome friends and just ask them about their work. And it's just really cool. So it just, I just love the energy that we got going on both. And just thank you so much for coming on. So my last and i hope you enjoyed your time here but are you kidding me i loved it this was such an enjoyable interview i don't know if you've noticed we've gone for an hour and a half and i told you i could be here for an hour but i was like i can push my next meeting because i didn't want to get off <laughs> thank you so much but my last no. question to you is what is your current message to the world during these current times that we live in i end off all my interviews with this question because yes. obviously we're living in a global pandemic. Laws are being changed. There's a ton of discussions going on about racial and just a, a lot of stuff going on around the world. So what would you say to people who are in need of hope? Three things. One I've already said, and I'm gonna reiterate it. Just because we are quarantined, just because we are physically separated, just because we can't travel the way we used to does not mean you are alone. If you are feeling lonely, if you are feeling sad, if you are feeling pain and depressed, if you are worried you are going to hurt yourself, any number of these things, reach out because people would miss you. I guarantee whoever you are, people would miss you if you were gone. So please, please, please make use of the fact that we have technology that allows us to connect with large communities, sometimes of compassionate strangers, sometimes of the people closest to us, but always reach out because you are not alone. That is one thing. Two, it is very easy in today's society to be overwhelmed by what you see on social media and what you see on the news and to get caught up 
in our little, in our phones and only reading this, please, please, please give yourself time without a gadget, even though we're watching on gadgets, give yourself time without a gadget to process your life, to smell the flowers, to pet your dog, to be with your family. You are not going to so miss out on anything that's happening on this gadget, but you can miss out on what's happening in the room with you. And that is really, really important. So we all have to choose where to put our attention in the world. Choose wisely, because we have a finite, that is a finite resource that you have is your attention and your energy. And then finally, we live in a world that is very judgmental now. And it is very easy to go online and snap to judgment about who a person is or something that they've done when you don't know the whole story or assume that you understand a person's life, a celebrity, a single person, anyone, someone you see, assume, it's very easy to assume you know someone's story and assume that you know their life. None of us know the whole story. So be compassionate to people. If someone snaps at you at the supermarket or someone is a jerk to you and cuts you off in traffic or whatever, you don't know the whole story. So you can be annoyed, but don't assume something about them because all of us is fighting a battle. Every single one of us is fighting a ba battle that someone else knows nothing about. So you got to be kind, especially now when there is so much strife in the world, when there is so much dividing, when there is so much judgment, when there is so much canceling. If there is no room for forgiveness, if there is no room for people to make mistakes, learn from their mistakes and be forgiven, we are doomed because we're all going to make mistakes. So be compassionate, be forgiving, be open and take care of yourselves. And remember, you're not alone. And all right, guys, that'll be our time. Angela, is there anything you want to plug before you head off? Boom, 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 boom. I got a bunch of projects coming out that I can't tell you about, but there's one I can. And that is season two of the Netflix show special, which is going to be airing May 20th. I have a, a nice big part in season two. I want you to come check it out. It's a fantastic, inclusive, beautiful show. Binge the first season. It'll take you one night. Boom, super easy. Um, check it out online. Share it on the socials. I'm really, really proud to be a part of this show. And then just find me on the interwebs at Sweet Ange uh, to hear more about other stuff that's coming. And again, if you uh, please check out I Am Fun Size. There are a lot of resources there for people to learn from my mistakes, learn from my experience. I share as much as I can on there, and so do a bunch of other actors like Fred Tadashor and Carolina Rasa and Jen Cohn and Jason Ritter and a bunch of other people. So check it out on YouTube. Absolutely. All right, guys. And of course, you can find me here now on my YouTube at Jam Moore. I'll see you guys later. Have an amazing day. I'll see you guys on my next interview. See you guys later. Bye, Have a great day. Everyone.